So far we have seen that we can have failure in rocks by tension, by shear, and now we're going to see that we can also have inelastic deformation in the form of compression. So let's go to this topic and this is what we're going to call compression failure which is often going to result in pore collapse. So let's imagine the following experiment in which we have a piece of rock which is subjected to vertical stresses and is not allowed to expand on the sides. Here we have an example of axial strain and axial stress and that we can see is that as we increase the axial stress axial strain is going to increase and at some point if I increase the axial stress too much I'm going to go into inelastic deformations caused by the crushing of the grains that is going to result into a significant decrease in porosity see this example from 20% to 8% and that can also result in significant decreases in permeability all right uh, let me present an alternative version to this plot, which is exactly the same, but a little bit more simplified in order to understand what's going on in here. All right, this is the same case in the plot that we have in, in the web page. What we see is in the x-axis uh, logarithmic or the logarithmic the logarithm of axial stress and in the y-axis the axial strain increasing going down and what we can see from here is that there is at the beginning an elastic domain after which if we pass a certain stress called the yield stress we go into the plastic domain this is where for example your grain crushing is going to occur Alternatively, we can also plot this in a linear scale with axial stress as we often do plot in the y-axis and the axial strain in the x-axis. Notice that still we have this type of one-dimensional strain compression. And what we see in this case is that the stiffness of this rock is going to increase with time. It's going to start soft and as grains start to, to break, this is going to get stiffer and stiffer. This is something important to, to notice, which is not quite clear from the plotting logarithmic scale, but this is what happens in reality. The stiffness is going to increase with time and every time it's going to be harder and harder to decrease porosity a little bit more. All right, so why do we care about this type of compaction? Basically, this can occur either on um, geological conditions, for example, with the compaction of sediments over time. We have already seen that compaction over time in a tectonically passive environment results in this uh, so-called uniaxial strain condition and compaction just in vertical direction with loss of porosity. But also, this can happen in a relatively short amount of time when we have depletion. For example, in this case, if we deplete this reservoir formation as we lower the pore pressure, effective stresses are going to increase with time. And the result of that increase of effective stress plotted here now in, uh, as a function of time is going to result in a compaction. In a compaction that most likely, if the formation is a much longer in horizontal direction than its thickness, and if the cap rock is compliant, is going to be a one-dimensional strain compaction. And we care about this because sometimes if uh, we compact the formation too much, we might have, as shown in the previous figure, subsidence of the seafloor if we are in offshore conditions or of the land surface if we are on onshore conditions which might not be uh, good might not be beneficial 
but also this could happen in loss of permeability in the formation itself and in order to avoid that uh, what we want to know is what is that maximum yield stress such that I do not go into significant decreases of porosity and significant decreases of permeability. All right, here let me show an example about uh, such a case. This is a study we did for a reservoir in the, in the Gulf of Mexico where uh, you can see that uh, as the effective vertical stress increases due to the, the decrease in pore pressure, the porosity decreases and also permeability decreases. In some of these cases, the decrease in permeability was so much that it would go to up to 20% of the original permeability, which is uh, quite a bit. And when this happens and you start to deplete the reservoir, again, if you have a very aggressive pumping schedule, what uh, that may result in is a significant decrease in permeability and therefore a decrease in flow rates. All right, this is why compression failure or pore collapse is important. Let's now close this discussion by putting again the, all the types of failure together and let's just spend a few minutes in order to revise all of these and understand exactly what they are. We started saying that rocks have a tensile strength and that is the maximum stress that the rock can resist in tension. Usually we measure this parameter when there is no stress in the perpendicular direction to the direction in which I apply the tension. And with that occurs, I would always expect a fracture to form perpendicular to the direction of the tensional stress, as you can see in this schematic. Let's go now to the shear. If my Mohr circle is somewhere in here, in this region, it's going to be limited by the shear yield or shear failure line. And when a rock fails in shear due to the anisotropin stresses, one compression stress is much larger than the other, then the rock is going to fail in shear. And in that case, the shear fracture is going to be oriented at an angle which is 45 degrees plus friction angle divided by 2, this is the angle, from the plane of the maximum principal stress, which in this case is the axial stress. Notice that in this case we have compression in both directions and that also the plane of failure does not align with either of the principal stresses. And finally, we just have seen that we can also have a compression failure in which uh, the limit of compression is usually given by this yield stress that we mentioned before, that it's uh, based on the maximum limit of Volume, the, and the maximum limit of volumetric strain or, the, or in terms of porosity you could also say that, uh, that you want to set and usually after you go after that maximum yield stress you start to see significant plastic strains this is the limit for compression and you can have for example a pure compression where all the stresses are the same in all directions. That would be a point somewhere over here, a more circle with a diameter equal to zero. Or you can also have combinations of compression and shear, a location somewhere over there. In that case, you have something which are called compaction shear bands. That if you are interested, you can go and look in the literature about those and uh, basically those are just a combination of compaction and shear that usually results in a reduction of porosity in the localized region of shearing.
All right. So with this topic, now we finish the discussion of inelastic strains and how they can occur uh, and how fractures also can occur due to tension, due to shear, and also due to compression. We'll see that all of these are important for uh, wellbore geomechanics, for reservoir geomechanics, and also for hydraulic fracturing.